Welcome back everyone to the Caregiver Training Camp. My name is Rob Fabian with Age of Central Texas and we are so glad that you're joining us. For those of you who are just joining us new for this session, welcome. We're so glad that you're here and we hope that this is some great information that can assist you in your caregiving journey. A couple of really quick housekeeping items. We are recording these sessions, so if for any reason you need to leave during a session, but you're afraid you're going to miss something, don't worry. Because we're recording these, we are going to be posting them on YouTube, and we are going to send you the links to all of the sessions, so you can go back and watch them later. You can share them with friends or family and have them as a resource. Speaking of resources, we're going to send you quite a bit of great resources next week, uh, including a copy of the Caregiver Playbook, a whole set of caregiver resources and information for you. And we're also going to be sending you an electronic survey. And we hope that you'll please complete that survey. It'll only take you just a few minutes, but it will be so helpful for us in planning future conferences and events. We want to find out from you what are some of the issues that you are dealing with as a caregiver so that we can find the experts to help you in your caregiving journey. And then finally, we want you to ask questions today because this is for you. This is why we are doing this, is to help you as a caregiver. And we have these fantastic resources here with us live today. So ask your questions. Down at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat feature. It looks like a thought bubble that you'd see in the comic strips. Click on that and it'll open up the chat box and then just type in your questions into the chat. And then at the end of the, each session, we are going to answer your questions. So feel free to ask all of those questions because you've got the experts with you right here today. And so let's take advantage of them. Speaking of experts, we are really grateful to have with us Lena Zupnet Zapata. She is a great friend of ours and an amazing resource. And Lena has more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry. She was a community educator and area director for 10 years in the hospice industry. And that's where she worked with families and healthcare providers to educate and advocate for increased awareness and better understanding of issues that emerge during the end of life. And then about nine years ago, she joined her mother-in-law, Frances Meir, to oversee the operations for Meir Senior Consultants. And Lena now serves as the vice president for Meir Senior Care Consultants, where she advocates that pre-planning in a complex healthcare system can help caregivers and families to maintain control of their choices and achieve greater peace of mind. That's what we talked about in that first session. Lena also serves on the board of directors for Age of Central Texas, the Aging Life Care Association, and she's an active member of the Women's Business Enterprises, Texas Guardianship Association, Dementia Friendly America, and the Austin LGBT, LBGTQ Chamber of Commerce. Lena, we are so grateful to have you here with us today so that we can talk about tackling medical issues. We know as caregivers that that is one of our biggest challenges that we have in helping care for our family members. And so we are so grateful to have you join us today to talk about how we can better manage the medical issues that we deal with. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rob, for that introduction. I appreciate it. I hope everybody is staying safe and warm out there. I um, don't know about you, but I woke up and I had a lot of ice on my uh, on my car, and so I just stayed put where um, I was and will be headed home um, after this presentation. But I'm so honored to be asked once again to um, talk to you all about some of the medical issues that I see from a professional standpoint, but also, um, let me just see if my screen will, hmm, here we go with, okay, <laughs> just making sure my, my slides are going. Um, so I am a professional uh, consultant when it comes to aging life care and special needs, but I'm also a daughter and a caregiver. 
And my caregiving journey really started when my dad got sick about five, it'll be five years on March 7th. And so um, I look at the journey of my caregiving and um, have experienced many of the things that I am going to talk to you about today. Um, this is an, uh, every time I do these presentations, they are in honor of my dad who said, you just got to keep on doing what you're doing because it's a good thing. So um, I, I bring just a brief a highlight about my parents um, and my caregiving journey. My parents uh, served in the US Navy as uh, military physicians. Um, they were active and social and travelers and uh, givers and medical missionaries after their retirement. Um, but then my dad suddenly got sick and I became um, a daughter and a caregiver who was handling an enormous amount of responsibility. And um, although it was hard, it was quite um, a learning experience. Um, which I think my dad would appreciate because it does help others now today. Um, but also I continue the caregiving journey uh, as a caregiver for my mom um, who now lives in Austin with me um, in an assisted living. So I continue the caregiving journey. When I speak to you, I not only speak to you from a professional standpoint, but also you know the, the, the journey from um, a daughter's uh, lens and, and point of view. So these are just these are my parents, um, my mom and dad when they first got married and came to the United States at 23. Um, their pictures when they were um, uh, at a uh, military event in their full uniform, um, and then my dad uh, on Valentine's Day. Uh, these last two pictures, um, it's one of the last pictures I have, but he really wanted to dance with my mom one last dance, um, and so that's why they're dressed in red. And uh, he really practiced in that last picture uh, was them practicing um, for, for their last dance together. So it's touching, um, it's a, a fond memory. And I just wanted to let you know that um, I am also relating um, these experiences and these issues that I'm gonna talk about from, from a personal perspective. So I thank you for um, allowing me to, to share my parents uh, with you. So one of the first things that I wanted to bring up is being um, a good advocate uh, for your loved one. And this will help tackle some of the medical issues that we're going to talk about today. You know, um, these statistics have been repeated over and over again, and they're only going to grow um, from the AARP's report on caregiving um, in 2020 that there are an estimated 53 million adults in the U.S. who are caregivers. Um, of those, 41.8 8% provide care for a person aged 50 or older. 24% uh, of caregivers are caring for more than one care recipient. And being a caregiver, it throws us into many situations we have, that we have not encountered before. It forces us, uh, as in my own experience, to take on roles that push us outside of our comfort zone and requiring us to learn new skills. Again, you know, we don't have a lot of opportunities to be a caregiver, but if you're caring for an elder adult, um, some, sometimes the crisis is when you jump in and you have got to be really prepared to know um, what um, you're going to be in for. So whether you're a caregiver and whether you like it or not, you become responsible for the health and well-being of, of someone else. One who may not, one who may need assistance not just day to day, but ongoing. Um, and not only the caregiving side of it, but also advocating for themselves as well. And so one of the most significant roles a caregiver plays is that of an advocate for their loved one. And I think this is the foundation um, and how to prepare or get prepared to be on your caregiving journey. So as it relates to caregiving, advocacy is defined are being a great advocate for your aging loved ones are the things that you do to ensure that your loved one receives the best care and services from the entire care team and continuum you have in place. You are their voice. So the foundation for being a good advocate is because it's such an important job and there's so many um, there's so many moving pieces and parts to someone's healthcare journey, is to put some of these things in place. And the first is to establish a care team that you have confidence in. Um, this includes medical professionals, 
There are aging life care managers that can also help family and friends and anyone who assists you in delivering care to your loved one. If you are uh, of a large family or you have siblings that are all um, involved in the caretaking um, journey, however that looks like, whether they can do a little or a lot, it's so important that you have conversations with everyone that's involved in the care team so that you know what the expectations are and what somebody else is able to do. If you start guessing, it causes resentment and it can cause a lot of issues. And when you're caring for somebody, those issues and those emotions shouldn't come up or try to at least avoid them um, because it's not an optimal time to have um, th those conversations. So having regular meetings and conversations and updates um, and having one point person or two point people involved, it's really important that you're having a constant dialogue with them. Um, because as you know, care can ebb and flow. It can be really good on some days and it can be really bad on, on other days. So to, to be clear and to understand what everybody's role is in, in, in the care journey. It's important to get organized. I'm gonna talk about um, things that can help you be organized. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, something that's called a book that can help uh, with pertinent information. Um, you'll also want to assess your own skill set, and you'll want to seek education for the areas that you feel you are not well-versed in and get the support if you are not able to fulfill those skills that are needed to, uh, to um, assist or support your loved one. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. Um, there are a lot of resources, which we're going to go over um, later on in the presentation, but um, do your homework and, and understand what you're able to do um, and what you're not able to do. It's really important um, in honoring and knowing what your elder adult or loved one wants. I work with a lot of families where we have adult children that don't include the parent in the decision because they want the best for their parent. But the parent or the elder that's being cared for is feeling a loss of control. Um, they need to have a say and a voice, even if they are not cognitive or they don't have the, um, you know, what we think is the capacity you should always consider asking them and involving them as much as they are able to participate in the decisions that are being made. Uh, take care of legalities. We'll also go over briefly with that, um, talking about certain documents that you need to have in place and understanding those documents and when they are in effect and when they are not in effect is very important. Um, also to review those on a regular basis. Uh, we've encountered many families um, or the elders that have had um, their estate plans and documents that were done in the 70s. And sometimes some of those people are no longer able to act as a advocate or an agent. Um, so it's really good to understand and consult with a legal um, expert to determine whether or not those documents are up to date and valid. Um, observe and question. Uh, I am one of those people that will ask question after question um, and observe and ask questions. And you, that is the foundation of being a good advocate. And hopefully with all of those questions, you get answers so that you can drive the care for, for your loved one um, and have a good understanding of what the care needs are um, should they move to a different level of care or they're discharged from the hospital you know what you need to do in order to support your, your um, elder adult. Communicate. Um, again, this goes back to talking about the care team, but communication is key. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces and parts when you are um, working with somebody that, of frail health. You're talking about the hospital, the discharge planner, the physicians, the follow-up appointment, family members, friends, caregiving agency, home health, maybe hospice. So it's really um, important that um, you have a uh, specific um, and uh, not spread yourself too thin approach to um, communication, but making sure that people are communicating with you and you are communicating with them. Um, 
trust yourself. This is um, really one of the things that we, we question when we're doing, are we doing the right thing? Are we, um, is this decision right? And um, so it's just really important to know that you've done your homework. You've had a lot of tough conversations. You've um, talked to professionals. You've gained sage advice. So when it it's time to make a, a big decision, trust your gut and have the confidence that your knowledge and your love and care will be enough to guide you to the answers that are needed. And then last but not least is certainly practice self-care. A burnt out, run down, unwell caregiver cannot deliver good care and advocacy. Take good care of yourself and recognize that doing so is not a selfish act. And I can't say this enough, especially for you women out there. This is not a selfish act to take care of yourself, but it is the best gift that you can not only give to yourself, but for the person that you're taking care of. So the first medical issue that um, are I, the several uh, medical issues that I am going to address today, um, not being prepared, appropriate medication management, and preparing for a hospital discharge. I see many of my families face with this as they take on caring for an aging parent, an elder relative or someone with special needs. Um, it was quite evident during the pandemic and as we continue today with different, faced with different variants, it became glaringly clear that many were unprepared for this journey of caregiving. Uh, there were hundreds if not thousands of people that were just thrown into the care, care journey, um, which not only caused additional stress and panic, but it also um, put people in a position to react in a crisis situation, which of course is not optimal. Then you add a lot of life stressors of homeschooling, your spouse is working from home, um, not being able to go out and do the things that, you know, um, that we did on a regular basis. So life changed for everybody. And then caregiving also became another layer of responsibility that many of us were faced with. Um, so the first, um, scenario that I'm relating to uh, not being prepared is a parent needs to go to the hospital for an emergency situation. What do, you, what do you need? And so this is something that I created, you know, for my, for my own parents and I share with my clients today and there's many different variations. This is not a set in stone book that, um, you have to follow this way, but there's a lot of resources and variations. So you can tailor it to the way that you wish to um, have your book look, but these are what I find are the most important things to have um, should your loved one go into the hospital. Um, this book, um, as you see here, is a vital part of um, what I recommend um, for each person that you are caring for. So if you're taking care of um, your parents, you should have one for, for each of them. Um, it is crucial that you review it on a regular basis and update it as necessary. It's important that you put it in one central location so that everybody knows where to access this information. For example, when my father was sick, I had it laid out there for the caregivers to access, um, for um, my siblings to access. And my sibling, who was an alternate agent to me for my dad, um, she also received a copy just, just in case. Um, uh, the book is a simple three ring binder. It's to house all of this collected information that I'm going to list that's listed here. And it will eliminate having to turn the house upside down, trying to find where these documents are. Oftentimes when I'm meeting with clients and we ask for these documents, they're somewhere in a lockbox, in a safe or at the bank in a safety deposit box. And these documents, especially when somebody is having um, you know, uh, health issues, they need to be accessible. Um, so having them in a lockbox is, doesn't do anybody good. Um, and some of you may have had that experience or say, oh, um, I, I better get access to, to, to those documents. Um, again, I also recommend that not only family members um, as designated agents be involved and have access to this information, but 
Um, also, the other family members, the other siblings who are not involved, who are not designated, that they also have access um, to this information. Emotions run high um, during um, a crisis. And so you don't want family members guessing and trying to figure out when the crisis is happening um, on things that you know, what, what, it, what are mom and dad's wishes and what are, where's the DNR? And um, I don't know what medications they are. So again, it goes back to anybody that is part of this care village or an, an extension of mom and dad, it's really good to, to also let them know where this information is. There's also several apps for those that are um, more technology um, savvy and, and want um, everything stored um, in the cloud or um, that's the, that's the uh, choice that you want to communicate with. A lot of these things can be shared in Dropbox or um, there's different caregiving apps where uh, um, these, this information can, can be stored. So what do we put in the book? Um, the book has the legal documents. Those are the financial and medical power of attorney. Should make sure that they're updated, they're signed, um, and that uh, everyone who is an agent, uh, agent meaning representative on that, has a copy of that information. The directives, um, the advanced directives, uh, which I'm going to talk about specifically um, to DNR, is not the same thing to is not the same thing as a directive to physician. So again, when we talked about educating and informing and understanding um, some of these things that, um, that are important to someone's healthcare, it's really good to know what does the financial power of attorney mean? What does the medical power of attorney, what are my limits there? What does the directive to physician include for? And, and really understand those documents because those are what, those are the wishes that you're supporting of your, your elder, um, elder adult or loved one. Um, the insurance cards, identification cards, prescription cards, social security and military ID, um, those should always, you should always have a copy of those. Um, they ask for them all the time. Uh, I would be a little bit leery on the um, social security and um, just just now because there's so much um, uh, you know, exploitation and fraud that I would um, probably remove that, but keep that in a secure place um, for, for safekeeping. A medication list, which we will go over in, in a little bit. Um, I'm gonna give you a tool to um, keep medication lists up to date and um, organized. Provider information. So these are all of the people that are involved in the care, whether you see them once a year, um, once every other year, it's really important to have all of the specialists, primary care. I even put the acupuncturist and any other um, holistic approaches to, to care um, on that provider information. It should also have, of course, their phone numbers, um, and um, general information on um, you know, their location and the last time that they, that they saw your, your parent. Uh, family contacts, that's everybody that's involved. Of course, an order of um, contact should be primary medical power of attorney and then secondary. And then any friends, uh, any other family members or friends um, can also be listed there. However, with that, I would recommend that there would be only one to two people that are kind of in charge of the communication and being the one primary or secondary contact because too many folks that are being contacted or involved um, can really dilute and confuse the communication stream as well as the information. It can get lost in translation the more people that um, the communication goes through. Uh, a HIPAA release is really important to have on there, um, and that allows for uh, a family member um, to talk to a medical provider on their elder uh, parent or loved one's um, behalf. Life insurance policies, long-term care policies. That information is very important to have, um, especially the long-term care policy. Um, you know, if it's going to pay for long-term care, it's really important how to access that benefit, when the assessment takes place, what's the reimbursement that's going to happen and how you receive that reimbursement, what it pays for. Um, Long-term care policies can be very uh, 
overwhelming and daunting. So again, when we talked about being a good advocate, it's really good to understand when is it time to activate that policy? When is it time to consult a professional or whoever the agent was that sold that policy so that you know exactly how to navigate using that benefit that your elder parent paid for, for probably a, um, a very long time. The final arrangements, um, this is also really important. Um, I think about my dad when he, um, when he had his final arrangements, he had a letter. He said that he had his obituary. He had money earmarked for the police, um, you know, because they were going to escort during the, the, um, procession from the church to the to the um, veterans um, cemetery. So he earmarked all of those things. And, you know, that was a little bit, I mean, he was overly prepared, but it's really good to know cremation, burial, where, um, and how, and what needs to be done when the time comes of the, um, the elders passing. Important phone numbers, those are agencies, hospice, home health, caregiving agencies, um, pharmacy, uh, that information is really important to have. And then who are the point people and who, what is the number to call after hours and on the weekends? Because sometimes it's not the, it's not the same number. And then of course, pharmacy information. Who's the pharmacist? Where do the medications come from? Um, and uh, is it mail order or um, pickup or, um, uh, and, and the location of, of that pharmacy? So I talked about advanced directives, and this is a copy of a DNR. And sometimes it's a little confusing because they say, yes, I have advanced directives, but then um, they, don't, uh, they don't have a DNR filled out. So this is an out of hospital, do not resusc resuscitate um, form. And some of you may be familiar with this, but if you're not, you can always go online and look, out, look up out of hospital DNR. And this is state specific. Um, every state has their own DNR, but for the state of Texas, as you can see in the corner, kind of blurry, but there is the logo of Texas um, in the corner. You keep your signed original form in a place where emergency medical professionals can find it. This is the only form. Um, I think you can also wear a bracelet. I might, don't quote me on that, but this form is what EMS first responders will um, look for um, to follow your wishes if you do not wish to be resuscitated. Um, if it's not accessible, CPR will be administered. When I was in hospice care, um, I, we always encouraged our, our um, patients to have that on the back of the door. Um, sometimes they put it in the freezer, which was interesting. And they do that because it's fireproof apparently. So that was another place, but also to keep a copy on your person and in the glove compartment box are the places that we have recommended. Um, so this is something that you fill out. Um, a physician has to sign it. Um, you can either have it notarized or you can have two witnesses witness um, signing this, this document. So um, it's really easy to um, fill out um, and you can have a social worker or in the hospital setting or even um, someone in your doctor's office to help you fill this out. It's also good that this DNR is on file at the hospital um, with any agency that your um, loved one is, in, um, is receiving care from and they'll usually ask for it um, in a nursing home and then the medical providers that um, are uh, supporting your um, elder parent. So the, uh, this was really quite apparent during um, COVID where so many people had to suddenly get to the hospital. And um, it, many, of, uh, many clients that had to go to the hospital only went to the hospital with the clothes on their back um, and didn't have anything else um, and then they didn't have anything else to wear. They didn't have any personal care items. So they went with what was on their back. And then many could not access their loved one because of COVID protocol and um, no one was allowed. There were no visitations um, allowed. So I put this in my presentation because I think it's also very um, important as someone that is going to have a baby, they're prepared with their bag to go to the hospital. I think that if you have a frail elder that you're taking care of, that you should have a bag ready, not only for them, but for you, because more than likely you're the one that's taking them to the hospital. 
So these are some of the suggestions that I have for you. Of course, you know, this is not set in stone and there's flexibility obviously with what you wanna put in there. But um, these are things, some, you know, that folks, we never really thought about before because, you know, we could come and go as we pleased in, in the hospital during visiting hours. So here are some of the few things. Um, of course, the book is really important if you can grab it and bring it with you. Um, vital statistics, medical medication list, insurance card. I think those are the keys. Um, but if you can bring that whole book, everything that is listed here is, is in that book. Um, for you, it's um, good to have important phone numbers of people that you need to get in contact with. Um, reading glasses, as you can see, I mean, um, you would, you would um, need that to probably review the enormous amount of documentation that you're going to have to go through when you're admitting somebody. An extra phone charger and make sure that they work. Um, sometimes the cafeteria is not open, so small change in bills to, um, to have with you. Earplugs and eye masks, um, as you know, it can be, um, it's not a quiet environment at the hospital, so uh, people are coming and going, so this might give you a little bit of um, silence um, and relaxation um, as you spend the night or spend a um, few hours um, at the hospital. Uh, pen and paper um, and notepads so that you can take notes. Again, observing and answering questions. You, if you wanna document that, you have um, the ability to do so. And reading material and other items like an iPad because sometimes in the hospital, you're waiting for tests and results um, to come in. And so um, just to pass the time, it would be good to have that with you. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to, um, oh, and I'm sorry, for, for your loved one, it's I think also to bring our, of course, changes of clothes and also um, personal care items, toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, uh, you know body soap, those types of things. Um, and then also a few pictures of um, family to have in that in that bag. You want to, if you can personalize the room a little bit. And then I had a, a lovely family that I worked with that wrote a little history about each of their parent or their dad and who he was before um, the disease started taking over his body. So you know he was a you know he he was an avid fisherman and he loved. Um, he grew up in Georgetown, Texas, and he loved doing this. He was a devoted father of four. So it was just really nice because when the, when the nursing personnel and medical staff went to visit him, they had a reference of who he was and not just a patient um, in the bed. So I think that was just a nice personal touch for, for him and, for, and a benefit for him and also to, to the staff. Okay, so the next medical scenario, um, medical issue that I'm going to go over is um, a scenario that happens quite a lot. Mom has four doctors. They all prescribe different medications. And so effective medication management is essential. Polypharmacy um, is a term that's used. And while there's no consensus um, definition for polypharmacy, most studies have used a numerical threshold of five or more medications um, per day. So adults over 65 are more likely to use combination of prescriptions, prescription medications, and over-the-counter medications to treat multiple conditions. Um, they are also more, more likely to experience harmful side effects from medication due to, the, due to changes that occur with an aging body. Um, sometimes they don't process the medication um, as they would as somebody that would be younger. And this increase in medication can lead to harmful side effects and interactions between drugs. Gone over these statistics. Give you a minute to, to read that. And if you look at the picture on the left, I walk into this scenario quite a bit. And this is kind of their medication management system. Um, maybe this is familiar to some of you out there, but I'm going to go over, um, you know, and give you some tools to uh, organize this in a better, in a better way. So here are some tips to gather um, and organize. And again, um, this picture on the right is something that um, I have walked into. So it's really important to gather and um, all the medications and vitamins and OTC medications and supplements in one location. Um, to stay organized and increase medication safety, keep all the current pill bottles and packages in a clear plastic storage bin so that you know what the contents are. 
and use a separate bin for their backup medication supply or medications that they only use occasionally. Um, separating them um, can eliminate confusion um, and, and, er and medication errors. So I really like this list, and this is actually from AARP, and this is a medication tracking list. You can go on AARP and look up medication list, and um, this will come out, and we, we print these for, for our own clients. Um, and it just has on the left there, you'll see um, the personal information, the physicians that are involved, um, allergies, and then medical conditions. And then on the right there, it's pretty self-explanatory um, what the what the patient, what the client is taking, um, the form that it's in, the dosage, how much and when and when they use it. Um, I would suggest writing this in pencil so that you can erase and update as needed. Um, most elderly as they go through um, different um, you know, hospitalizations and um, perhaps their disease process is, is changing and it's getting um, more complicated that perhaps more medications might be introduced. So it's just good um, to help preserve you and not have to print and reprint and rewrite and rewrite to, to um, write in pencil here so that you can update um, accordingly. So some good medication management tips is to invest in a pillbox or a dispenser. Um, even though my parents were physicians, their medication management system was shocking. And it was really my dad putting my mom's meds in a bowl for her morning, a little petite little sauce bowl. And then she could just take it whenever she felt like it, because even though she is a physician, she, sometimes she wasn't compliant. So um, it's really good to invest in a pillbox or a dispenser um, to set up reminders I'm setting up reminders um, if they have a smartphone or if there's a caregiver in the home, certainly you can set up um, reminders on the phone or even use a simple alarm clock. Um, I have family members that actually just call their loved ones say it's time to take your medication, um, but sometimes we all are not afforded that time. So um, using um, a, a reminder system um, such as the smartphone um, is a good idea. Using a single pharmacy, if at all possible, um, this is really important. Your pharmacist is the key to a lot of, um, you know, alerting you and saying, hey, you know, the, these medications can cause a negative drug interaction. Or um, you can ask, you know, if I take this vitamin, is it going to interact with any of the medications that my parent is taking? So it's good to know who that pharmacist is. Um, Store your medications properly. If it's refrigerated, keep it in the refrigerator. Um, uh, avoid heat, leaving it in the car. Um, make sure that they're taking the medications properly. And there are medication boxes where you have AM and PM. And I'm sure that this is not new to a lot of people. It's just a gentle reminder of, um, to, to use that because sometimes our elders have their own system of, of doing things. And it's, you know, looking outside in um, probably most of the time is not um, the best way to, to manage medications. And then again, review medications regularly um, with your physician, especially coming out of the hospital where there may be um, new medications introduced. It's really good to talk and um, with those follow-up appointments and saying, this is what I had in the hospital. Should we continue um, or discontinue? Or perhaps he would make a different recommendation. So here are some medication management systems that, that we use, um, automatic pill dispensers. Uh, we've had, uh, and this is not an endorsement for any one of these, so um, just disclosure there. Um, we use the Hero machine for some of our clients that have um, some physical limitations or, or cognitive um, impairment. Um, this automatically dispenses, uh, it's locked. We set it up and um, there's apps that you can use to um, dispense or if there's any issues. So this is a little bit costly, but um, it sometimes proves to be a really good solution and benefit for, um, for those clients. Pill pack um, through Amazon, they can do pre-packaged um, by, uh, by the dosage and then by the time of day and split those up for you. So all you would do is tear out the pill pack and then open it up and, um, and uh, the elder would be able to take that, or the caregiver can help um, open um, the pill, uh, rip open the pill pack. Um, blister packs, um, those are uh, 
medication cards that the uh, the medication is in a blister pack and you just pop it out um, as needed. It's an organized way. It's numbered by, you know, 30 days. It'll have 30 blister packs there and you just pop out the medication. Um, they're, they're kind of big, big and cumbersome, but um, they, they usually use those in the nursing um, or assisted living um, environment. And then, of course, your basic plastic medication pill organizer. There's so many different variations, colors, you name it, personal preference. Um, but of course, you can get those through the drugstore or through um, Amazon. And here are some examples of the blister pack, the pill, um, pill packs, and then a um, pill, uh, pill dispenser. And this one is a fancy one. It has the, the alarm on it. So the last scenario is discharge planning. Dad or mom is being discharged, what do I do? And this is talking about the care village that's important and also where your advocacy really comes in um, to um, being a good uh, advocate for your loved one. So what do you do? A trip to the hospital can be really intimidating and especially when you don't have a lot of accessibility because of COVID. Um, and it can be really traumatizing for not only the patient, but the families as well, especially if you're caring from a distance. So as a caregiver, you're focused completely on your family member's medical treatment. And so is the hospital staff. Um, so you might not be giving a whole lot of thought. You're just looking and reacting to the crisis and trying to get that resolved. But what happens when they leave the hospital? You know, the responsibility is to have a safe discharge, but what happens outside of the hospital walls are going to land on you. So the transition can be a little bumpy, so it's really good to know what to expect. Um, you have to ask whether the discharge is going to be home, um, a rehabilitation, rehab facility, a nursing home. Um, it's critical to the health and well-being well of your loved one to really understand what the next level of care is going to be. Um, we hope that there's not going to be anything post-discharge um, except follow-up with physicians, but the reality is, you know, if there's a fall, a breaking of the hip, um, that they will go to a skilled nursing facility and what that's going to look like. Um, patients, families, and caregivers, and healthcare providers, we all play roles in maintaining a patient's health after discharge, but again, the responsibility outside of the hospital wall usually falls to, um, to the family member. So this is where your communication, your advocacy, your research, your educate, the, the homework that you've done, this is where you really have to know and be confident and um, kind of push, drive the care forward. So knowing, planning the discharge, know who the discharge team is. And that's the doctor, the nurse case manager, any specialists that have come into, um, into, into care. Um, it's, and usually it's the case manager on the floor or the social worker who will be the lead in talking about the discharge planning um, and when that's going to happen. My rule of thumb is, if, you know, if they've been admitted to the hospital, they're already starting the discharge. Um, and so it's good to know way ahead of time who those people are and who's going to be instrumental in making sure that your loved one has a safe discharge. So getting ready to go home. If you're going home, you've got to know, is the space ready and um, appropriate for them to come home? Do you have the supplies that are needed? Um, is it set up safely? Do you have um, you know, the care in place? Do you have the room? Um, do you have to remove furniture? So all of these things um, should be assessed before your loved one comes home. Make sure that it's um, safe, remove rugs, um, put a phone in there. I, I like to suggest putting a whiteboard so that you know, kind of keeping on task with things. Um, what are the health healthcare tasks that are going to be involved? Um, you should also ask about special foods or dietary changes. Sometimes there's difficulty swallowing or they're having trouble chewing. So um, consulting the dietitian and asking them if there's any modifications to the diet because um, worst case, you don't want somebody aspirating or um, having difficulty eating um, because you're not aware of those, those, those needs are changing or changes. Medication management. I had referenced before that a lot of times there's medications that are introduced, so it's really important to understand what is being, um, what is being introduced, but also to make sure that you're communicating those changes and additions 
to the um, providers that are going to be followed up with post-discharge. You also have to ask about what are the follow-up appointments. And again, that's another layer of responsibility for you as the caregiver um, to make sure that um, all of the follow-up appointments are done um, after discharge and when they, those are gonna happen. Um, again, this takes planning and organizing because not everybody has the freedom to have um, days where they can devote and you're juggling life, kids, spouses, and work. Um, so it's good to be very organized um, in this area. However, if you don't, you should ask for help and make sure that um, you can get that support system in place so that your loved one can um, get the care and be attended to and follow up on those medical appointments. So this is um, something, again, that you can find on Medicare.gov, and this is a great resource. It's a discharge planning um, checklist. And so this, again, you can make a copy. And now as I'm thinking about it, it would be a great thing to put in that bag or in the book um, that I had recommended earlier. And you can take notes here. And um, you know there, there are certain questions and action items that you can ask, uh, many of which I've shared in the previous slide. And then you can write notes. So I think this is a good tool for, for everyone to have so that you're not just housing it um, up, you know, in, in your head. So self-care um, is the last thing that I talked about in the beginning, but it's also in closing here, is being a caregiver is a big job, whether your family member is in the hospital, they're getting ready to go home or are ready at home. You need to take care of yourself, not just your family member. This means paying attention to your feelings as well as physical health. It also means taking time for yourself, even if it's just for a short while every day. Consult a professional if you need that support and help. And lastly, and in closing, um, there's some resources here. I believe that Rob has a copy of my PowerPoint, so you can refer to this. But these are some national and local um, resources that can help um, as you do your homework and you educate yourself on what needs to, um, on those things and those areas that you need um, more insight on. And of course, um, age of Central Texas. I can't speak highly enough about them um, and the good works that they do. I'm so proud to be um, a board member um, and giving this gift of resource and support and dedicated staff and Thrive Centers. Um, there's so much that they do. So um, please call. Um, I have the number there. Um, you, of course, have um, our uh, host and facilitator, Rob Fabian, that um, is a host of information and I know very accessible. Um, and then the website there. And then an, I am part of the Aging Life Care Association. We are um, uh, Aging Life Care Geriatric Care Management Association. And so across the country, whether it's in Texas or um, California, East Coast, West Coast, they have experts in aging well, um, such as myself, um, across the country. Um, and so it's not just local, it's nationwide. And our website is there, aginglifecare.org. Um, I'm so appreciative again for the opportunity to speak to you all. I hope you all stay safe and warm. Um, and um, I wish you well on your caregiving journey. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lena. We really, really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, I just posted also into the chat a link for the AARP's Prepare to Care Guide. This is a PDF guide that's available in multiple languages. Uh, it's a resource that we use extensively here at Age of Central Texas. It has a wealth of information and a lot of this, some of the great things that Lena went over with us today, the checklist, medication charts, contact lists that you can create yourself and have available for you. So be sure and take a look at that because it's a another free resource that's available to you. Lena, if you don't mind unsharing your screen, we've got a few questions that uh, we'd like to go over. Sure. Um, one thing that I also wanted to point out, speaking of AARP, they were instrumental in helping pass the Caregiver Act, which was passed uh, just a couple of years ago by Congress. This is an act that requires the healthcare 
prof professionals and providers to provide to give you specific instruction as a caregiver whenever your loved one discharges from uh, the hospital or from rehab. To make this work, you need to tell them when you're at the hospital, hey, I am the caregiver of record. That is really important. When you check in and when you're there, tell the doctors, tell the social worker who is there, I'm the caregiver of record so that they know that you are the person that they need to show when your loved one goes home, this is how you take care of them. This is how you change their bandage. This is how you transfer them into the wheelchair that they're going to have temporarily. They are required to go over everything with you, to give you all the discharge information, and to specifically show you what you're supposed to do when you get home. So that is the new law. Obviously, it's a new law. So a lot of healthcare folks don't know about it quite yet and are still adapting to it. Of course, it happened in the middle of COVID, which we know threw everything asunder. So please be patient with them because they're still figuring all of this out as well. But you have a right to know all of this and they are required to do that for you. So once again, it is called the Caregiver Act of 2021. And it requires healthcare professionals to show you and teach you what you need to know whenever you, your loved one discharges. As the caregiver, they are required to show you and teach you what you need to know so that you can be successful when you go home. This helps them out as well because they really don't want you coming back with your loved one when something else happens with them because you didn't know how to take care of them. So it's very beneficial on both sides. So just make sure that when you, it, again, as Lena says, it's not going to be an if, it's a when, you're going to have to go to the hospital with your loved one at some point. Make sure that you, when you're signing in, when you're with a doctor, when you're with a social worker, tell them, I am the caregiver of record. They will put it on the chart and then advocate for yourself. You know, I need to know. When they go home, what do I need to know? Give me all the paperwork. Give me all the instructions. Show me physically how I do this. They're required to do it, so advocate for yourself and ask for it. Make sure that they that you get that. Lena, we're talking about putting together a book, which is so, so important because having all that information in one place where you know where it all is, mm -hmm. is invaluable because I personally have gotten to the hospital with my dad and it's like where did I put the note from that other doctor who said this or that having it all in one place is so important where should we keep this book well I kept my father's book because he was ill um, I kept it you know near his bedside or somewhere in in the room so wherever it's going to be whether it's you know in the office or at the front door at the at the side table everybody needs to know where, where that book is. I instructed caregivers, here it is if I'm not here. My siblings, here it is if I'm not here. My mom, if she was able to do it, here it is, take that with you. But I also recommend making a copy or copies of some of that pertinent paperwork, putting it in that bag to go. Um, and, and then also giving a copy to the alternate. Um, usually on a power of attorney, there's always another person. So they should also have um, be the holder of that information. Right, yeah, having it right by the door with the bag so you can just grab both and go when mm -hmm. you need to. Yeah. And maybe some of the important pieces having copies of those in a folder in the car somewhere yeah. also, yeah. because mm -hmm. you never know, you know, you might be out on the road and something happens and the book's yeah. back in the house, but we've got to go right now over to the emergency room. Right. So having it, you know, redundancy is never a bad thing. No. <laughs> um, Someone was asking about that Caregiver Act. It is a federal law. It was put into federal law back in 2021. So it does, it affects all over the whole U.S. Uh, Lena, I'm going to lean into your expertise a little bit. One of several of the questions we had in our first session had to do with putting together our village of support around us, our community of support, and in particular, how to engage family members. Um, two things in particular. One, the family member who is not eager to help, but always eager to criticize. How do we, how do we handle that? 
And secondly, when we've got family members who are uh, outside of the area, uh, in particular in other, other states and other parts of the country, how can we involve them in the care of the family members? Well, first of all, I have to say, because this is a road that I have traveled on, is that you have to handle it with a little bit of grace. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes, and I think in hindsight, as I'm looking back, I, ex I expected, I expected dad's sick. This is what we're going to do. This is what you're going to do because not only my profession, but where I am in the birth order, I'm the oldest kid. So I'm like, we're, I'm just directing and saying, and not really asking and having a family meeting and saying, what are you able to do? And what do you want to do? Um, I think especially when there's multiple siblings involved, and even when it's just two of you, it can you can have the birth order resentment, you know, rear its ugly head. And again, that's not the time to really have those arguments. So I always suggest a family meeting. COVID has really helped us in the ability to communicate by Zoom. Um, and get that family meeting more on a regular basis rather than when we see each other at Christmas. Um, so I think having those difficult um, and sometimes heated conversations with those that are going to be involved. But if you are the lead caregiver, you also have to set your boundaries and say, you know what, this is what I'm able to do. This is what I'm going to do. And if you don't like it, well, then you can come here. <laughs> and you, I mean, that is the reality. And I'm sure many of you, several of you have had that feeling. And you have to set your boundaries and say, listen, I, this, I'm doing the best that I can. And this is what I'm able to do. This is what mom wanted. And you have to stick to your guns. But you also have to give yourself grace. It can be very stressful. Um, as you can see, I'm, you know, I'm going through a stressful time taking care of my mom right now because we're having some issues. But um, you just really... Um, it is going to be beneficial to your own health to be able to to set those boundaries. And so what was the second part of yeah. oh, families at a distance? Yes. Again, that is uh, really, again, Zoom has afforded us to have conversations and dialogue um, and understanding what is your schedule when you're going to come here? Um, and when, when, and you know, it's not a selfish thing to say, you know, I'm going to need a break. When can you come? What responsibilities will you take because you're the alternate? Will you handle medical appointments and I'll handle, you know, all of the social activities for mom going to church, handling the caregivers um, and delegating those responsibilities. Um, and it's okay to delegate the responsibilities. You cannot do it all. And I, it took me five years to figure that out. I was doing everything. And then I just said, I'm emotionally tapped out. I cannot do it anymore. I'm going to ask you to do this. And I'm going to do this. And if they can't do it, then you should engage in kind of your village of friends, um, caregiving agency, um, aging life care managers, age of Central Texas, and look to see where those resources can fill in where you're not able to handle those things with care. Yeah, you know, you, you made me think of something, you know, how <laughs> parents always say, when you ask and ask and ask, the answer is because I'm the mom and I said so. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that with your siblings and say, I'm the main caregiver and I said so. Yeah. And that's where that's the buck, right. because the buck stops with me. Right. And, you know, again, if you don't like it, you come move over here and you take care of mom 24 seven. Right. But, you know. <laughs> Not all of us are cut out to be caregivers, and, right. and we understand that. And sometimes, you know, our siblings just don't have the skills within them right. or the emotional ability to deal with this. You know, yes. it's hard to watch someone that we love, that we grew up with, decline. Yeah. And, and, it's, and some of us just can't deal with that, and that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. There are other things that they can do that can be very helpful. And we talked about some of those in the first session. For those of you who didn't join us with that, you know, Zoom is a tremendous way for us not only to visit as a family and have these kinds of conversations, but also for them to be engaged with a family member if they live somewhere else. You know, set up a regular time every week where we're going to sit down with Zoom and you get to visit with mom or dad. Yes. And, you know, spend and tell them, you know, you're going to be on here for 30 minutes with them and you're going to keep them engaged for 30 minutes because while you're doing that, I'm going to go take a shower or <laughs> do the dishes or whatever I need. I'm going to go read all my book and mm -hmm. just 
disconnect. Yeah. You know, I'm going to scroll through Facebook for 30 minutes yeah. because I need that, yeah. whatever it is, because that gives you that respite that you need. And as you pointed out, it is so important as caregivers that we have to take care of ourselves. It's not being selfish. It is being practical. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And and if I may add, add is self-care is not getting a massage or, you know, I mean, that could be great, but, you know, it's just taking 30 minutes of quiet time to decompress for yourself, taking a walk or, you know, investing in your health and, you know, working out for an hour, um, you know, reading, whatever that, that fill, you know, that can give you just a breath. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to a place or spend money, um, but it's just taking time out of the day dedicated solely to you. Yes. That's important. Yeah. yeah, because if anything happens to you, who's going to take care of your loved one? So mm -hmm. you have to, as we always say, put your oxygen mask on first. It is just the practical self-reliant thing that you have to do as a caregiver. And yes, it's hard to find that time. Yes, it's hard to carve it out and, and to do it, but you have to do it. You have to set your boundaries and find that time and stick to it and yeah. say, this is my time. Yeah. And, and, and use that time. I would love to have more of the conversation on the sibling dynamic and, you know, conversation. And um, it's always, it always makes for interesting, <laughs> interesting conversation. It is. So that and would be know, my suggestion for next, for next uh, conference. <laughs> we'll have a, we'll have a whole session on how we deal with family dynamics. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> that is, that is a fantastic idea. And noted and we will do that. <laughs> uh, we had another question about insurance, in particular, um, the predatory Medicare and Medicaid people who keep calling and convincing mom she's got to change to a new plan and she believes them. And now we've gone through multiple plans over the past year and we can't stick with one. How do we help control that? Well, I don't know how the calls are coming in, but certainly um, I've had to call and you know remove them from from the list. But sometimes it's not um, it's it's unavoidable. Unfortunately, I wish I had a magic answer. You know, I came home when my dad was in the middle of crisis, and one of his friends converted him to a Medicare Advantage plan. My mom and dad were both on Medicare and um, Tricare for Life, which is the gold standard for any. You can go anywhere with that and uh, covered 100% of everything. So when I came back home and I found out that they were on um, a Medicare Advantage plan and I wanted them to go to a particular skilled nursing facility, I had to pay out of pocket $10,000 because they weren't in network. And then you can revert back to traditional Medicare, um, but it you know it, it doesn't if you if you uh, call at on the second of the month, it won't go into effect until the first of the following month. So you're still responsible if you need care within that 30 days before they take um, before it reverts back to the original benefit. So while I don't have a magic answer, and I did chew that person that converted my parents, um, I, I, it's if you can get them off the call list, um, that that would be great. Um, unfortunately, sometimes that that's not all possible. Um, perhaps somebody that is in the and I can um, send a resource to Rob, and we certainly know a lot of people in this industry um, that perhaps they can give you some sage advice on what would be the best way to kind of di divert that um, and redirect because that is unfortunately the nature of the beast that today of, of um, taking advantage of elders is, is running rampant. Um, so I would love to look into that for you and then give the information to Rob on um, a, a really good answer um, for that. That's great. And that's a resource that we can send out after the conference. A uh, reminder, we are going to send you next week a ton of resources for caregiving resources. We're going to send you all the PowerPoints from today. I have been posting them on the AGE website and I put that into the chat as well so that you can grab them as we go. But we're going to send everything to you in one central email that will have links to the videos of all of these uh, presentations. We'll be posting them on YouTube so you can access them later. We will have all of the resources and a lot of great information for you there. Uh, one resource that we had talked about in the first session we'll talk about once again is the Area Agency on Aging. They are the pass-through money of the Older Americans Act. You've got one in every major city in the U.S. So every square inch of the U.S. is covered by at least one area 
Secretary Agency on Aging. The one here in the Austin area covers seven counties. And among the services that they provide is benefits counseling. Because as my dad would say, they don't have a dog in the hunt. And so they can give you very honest answers and support on those benefits like Medicare and Medicaid. And so they can help talk you through what the different parts are, what the different add-ons are, all of that. And they could probably help you with this question as well, is how do I keep someone on the one and not get them to keep changing them? So take advantage of that resource because they're free. You pay for them with your tax money. And so it's the Area Agency on Aging of uh, the Capital Area is the one here for Central Texas, or just go online and search for Area Agency on Aging and your town or your zip code, and it'll tell you which one serves you. So that's a okay. tremendously good resource. And of course, here at Age of Central Texas, we have our Caregiver Resource Center that can help you at any time with any of the questions that you have.